Meet the sheriffs. Let's go and introduce ourselves. My high court enforcement officers. We're here today to execute a high court writ. Their job is to get you your money back. It's restable offence to stop me and do my job. If you've been ripped off and don't know where to turn... I'm not waiting anymore. I'm ordered to seize goods to clear this debt, which would mean clearing this place out. If you've been to court but still not been paid what you're owed... Why don't you just tell me who you are? This is an absolute crop. You need to pay this. It's time to call the sheriffs. I've seized your car, sir. You can have a letter through the door or we'll go through the window. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're enforcement officers of the High Court. And the law says they're on your side. It's collected 42 grand. Coming up. Lucy Horton won an injury claim when a tattoo removal left her scarred for life. A minor procedure like laser tattoo removal shouldn't cause third degree burns. Enforcement officer Pete Spencer confronts the salon owner, but will he get Lucy her money? When repairs to Mohammed Razak's dream car went wrong, it cost him a fortune. It's cost me £8,000 to £9,000 and left me without a vehicle for six to seven months. Sheriffs Lawrence and Kev pay the garage a visit. Can they get him the money he's owed? If you're acting on his authority to pay it, pay it. In East Anglia, Daryl and Mark encounter builder Keith Topman, who's not happy the sheriffs have come to call. I feel sick. He's been taken to court in order to pay his debts. Next thing, you boys are on my doorstep wanting the money. But first, Enforcement Officer Pete Spencer is on the lookout for a business in West Yorkshire. Next, we're off to uh, Mythen Road, which is near Halifax. This is a case of tattoo removal that went badly wrong. The person Pete's on his way to help is Lucy Horton from Todmorden in West Yorkshire. She's a professional beauty therapist dedicated to making other people look as good as she possibly can. I do nails, massage, eye treatments, waxing, that kind of thing. And when I started at the college, I just loved it. And it's been my passion ever since. But Lucy herself was given a cosmetic procedure so bad, it left her physically and emotionally scarred for life. Forced to go to court and to the doors of the sheriffs for help. Lucy's problem started after she got offered her dream job working as a beauty therapist on a cruise ship. Um, I was trying to mix a little bit of work with pleasure, um, be able to meet new people, have fun. But the job came with a strict condition. Lucy had a butterfly tattoo on her left wrist. If she wanted the job, she would have to get it removed. When I found out I had to get rid of my tattoo, I was obviously devastated, but turning down the job on the ship was never a consideration for me. She'd heard about a laser procedure offered by a local beauty parlour, Hair and Beauty World of Mythenroyd near Halifax, run by Howard Pilling. My mum had been there before. She'd started having a tattoo removed. I'd been there for my hair done before. It was a salon that had been recommended by other people. Howard, the man that carried out the treatment for me, made me feel really confident that it was going to work. He showed me evidence of other people that he'd treated. He was a professional. He was the one that I was taking the advice from, so I believed everything that he told me. It wasn't cheap, but it was what she wanted, so Lucy paid them £800 for as many sessions as it took to complete the job. The first few treatments were unpleasant, but fitted in with what she'd been told to expect. But when Lucy went back for her fifth session, something had changed. Howard informed me that he'd got a new machine, it'd be quicker, um, and less painful, which obviously for me was a, a bonus. It's a painful process to go through anyway, and to have it a little bit easier was obviously something I was thrilled about, so I was happy to go forward with the treatment. During the treatment, I found that it was more painful, with a lot more heat and a lot more depth to it. Um, it had me in tears. I couldn't breathe properly. And with the machine, it kept cutting out. I had a friend with me, and she asked me if I was OK, because I was crying that much. And I just said to her, don't talk to me, I'll be sick. And then at that point, Howard asked me if I was OK, um, which I replied that it was a lot more painful than usual. And he just told me that we were nearly finished. He rubbed some aloe vera gel on it at the end and told me that everything would be fine. But a few days after the procedure, 
Lucy's wrist became inflamed. It wasn't until about a week later that I realised things weren't going as they normally would. When you touched it after the blisters had popped, it was like jelly under the skin. I went to the doctors and it was there that they told me I had an infection and I was put on antibiotics. Then after that, it still didn't heal. The skin came off and you could see all the jelly underneath. Lucy took herself to accident and emergency. The doctors told her she had third degree burns and a serious infection. When I found out that I had um, third degree burns, I was obviously a little bit mortified. It's not something you expect from a procedure like that, um, from having a tattoo lasered. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit emotional about it. But Lucy still didn't realise how serious the situation was. I was a little bit naive and carried on thinking that it'd heal normally and I'd carry on with the procedure and still get to go on with cruise ships. The wound took weeks to heal and Lucy's dream of working on the cruise ships faded. Far from disappearing, the burn formed a disfiguring scar. Lucy was still in considerable pain and for a while lost some use of her hand. I struggled to have a bath on my own, do my hair on my own, just because of the pain and not being able to make a fist or use my hand properly. Lucy's mum, Hazel, was shocked at how the treatment affected her daughter. Lucy changed from being a, a bright and vivacious fe young female with, with a life ahead of her. She turned more or less overnight into somebody that was very withdrawn. She didn't want to go out. She didn't really want to communicate with anybody. And she was quite an angry young lady. The hospital told Lucy she would need a skin graft. They took um, skin from my thigh and put it onto my wrist. Um, as you can see, it's still quite a severe scar and it's something that's not going to heal any more than that. Appalled at what had happened to her and determined to get justice, Lucy took salon boss Howard Pilling to court. He contested the case. So when we were attended court for the final hearing, it had been a very emotional and difficult time for me. And I struggled with it, I really did. Sorry. The case was heard in the small claims court, where Lucy got the maximum personal injury award of £1,000, a refund of the treatment fee and costs. When the judge awarded the case in our favour, I brought down, I couldn't believe it. It was such a relief for it to all finally be over and to know that I'd, I'd got what I deserved and that I wasn't fighting a lost cause. The judge praised my mum and I for what we'd done. In total, Mr Pilling was ordered to pay Lucy £2,430. He agreed to pay in £500 instalments, but the payment stopped. Despite all the pain caused, Lucy still hasn't been paid what she's owed. Now, over four years after the treatment, it's time for Pete to make sure the salon boss pays what's due. Pete doesn't know the details of Lucy's story, but he knows he has to get her the money. Hiya, OK. Looking for a Mr Pilling? Yeah. Is he about? Yeah, yeah. The staff seem surprised to see Pete, who is fairly obviously not a customer. He's looking for Howard Pilling, the man who performed the disastrous tattoo removal. Hiya, good afternoon. Enforcement officer. Oh. Got an eye caught rate to attend here today. Do you want to speak through it? High court rate. Do you want to speak through here? See you know, in front of your customers? Well, you're not talking with me. Mr Pilling doesn't want to appear on television, and our camera is asked to go outside while Pete outlines the case. Lucy, Hooten and Hazel, hold up. We've come to collect the money. Yeah. Mr Pilling says he has no money. OK, we'll be removing goods then. We'll just have to take whatever we can to, to try and recover the outstanding. I'll order a, a removal truck. The, the best idea is to pay something, to be fair. Mr Pilling says he has already paid the claimant £1,000. So Pete asks the office to check with her. Um, just with the defendant at the moment, he's saying two payments, um, value of £1,000, have been cashed. But there's no credit showing on my paperwork. OK. No problem. Thanks. Bye-bye. She has confirmed you've paid £1,000. You're still in breach of your court order, I'm afraid so you still have to pay the remainder. 
Mr Pilling was supposed to be making five payments of £500, but he's only made two, so the court has ordered Pete to collect all of the rest. But Mr Pilling won't pay. You're refusing to pay anything, yeah? With no payment forthcoming, Pete is going to seize goods to sell at auction. The salon owner suggests seizing just one item that's worth the amount owed. If you want to show me that item and I'll value it and see if it is. Pete's shown a laser the owner claims cost £25,000 and will be worth at least 2500 This is going to do nothing in auction. I can get an auction value on that. And it'd be under a quid or something stupid. It'd cost more than that to remove it. Mr Pilling produces another tattoo removing laser. A tattoo removal one, is it? He's talking about a £25,000 uh, tattoo removal uh, machine, um, which, I mean, looks maybe in between three to £500 at auction value to me. Even if Pete seizes goods, it will be cheaper to pay the full amount. I'd rather you sort it rather than lose your goods. And then we're back next week because I've only done 200 quid. As we speak, it's 254419. Um, any time I spend on site will be chargeable after an hour. And then you've got recovery costs and then storage fees and auction fees on top. Mr Pilling is thinking of paying. It's got to be clear funds, yes. So debit card, credit card, cash or bank transfer. But in case the payment doesn't appear, Pete heads into the salon to continue seizing equipment owned by the business. One of the stylists asks how long Pete will be around for as they are expecting a busy Friday afternoon. It'll be closed today, potentially, if they don't sort it out. Items have been seized to the value of the outstanding debt. I've given him 10, 15 minutes to try and make some phone calls to, to raise the funds rather than us remove goods. Faced with having several items seized and removal costs on top, the defendant has a change of heart and finds someone to pay the money for him. Um, he's got his uh, daughter on route um, with a, a credit card. That's going to pay the balance in full. Um, she's about five, ten minutes away, so uh, hopefully once she arrives, the we'll, uh, credit card will work and we'll, we'll have a full payment. Yeah, will do. Sound cheers. The card has arrived. Bye-bye. Do you want to do it out here, then you're not disturbing your customers? No, it's all right. OK. Yeah, no. All right. <laughs> Although Pete offers the option of doing the payment discreetly, Mr Pilling doesn't seem to mind people knowing the sheriffs have called. I'll try and be as discreet as what we can, that's all, you know. Pardon? Try and be as discreet as what we can, really. I don't like yeah, disturbing yeah, customers and stuff. At the end of the day, it's your business, isn't it? So. Yeah, it's, it doesn't matter. I'll... Uh, I'll put a banner outside afterwards. <laughs> if you can just pop your pin number in and then press the green button, please. Just need a signature off there. That's your receipt for payment. When Lucy Horton came here in 2009, she left scarred for life. Finally, the salon has paid her the money she's due. All cleared up, paid in full. Money will be gone to the claimant now. This money that I'm going to be receiving, it just it means that I'll have closure on everything that's happened in the last four years. It means that I can move on with my life and aim for that dream job that I've wanted to do for the past four years and that I can finally go ahead and do that. It's going to help finance my time in London during the training period before I actually get on the cruise ship. I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Pete Spencer. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Thanks a lot. These days, sheriffs are officially called enforcement officers of the High Court. Yeah, high Court enforcement officers. We're enforcement officers with the High Court writ. Enforcement officer, got an High Court writ. If you've been awarded money by a court but haven't been paid, the sheriffs can enforce a writ and get you what you're owed. And I'm here with a court order to collect the sum of £34,311. £6,246.99. We've come to collect £12,056.76. <laughs> And if the debtor won't pay, they have the power to seize goods and have them sold at auction to pay off the debt. I'm going to call the locksmith then, sir. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. That will keep them. So that's now seized. Freddy's coming with us for today. In the rural northwest of England, there's the prospect of a day enforcing writs in the countryside for enforcement officers Chris Pearson and Steve Hockborn. Right, we're in Cumbria on the way to Egremont this morning. We're looking for a company, Cumbria Roofing Northwest Limited. Uh, we're looking for £2,913.69 on behalf of a Mrs. Kathleen Ann Horton. It's a relatively small amount, 
so there should be enough assets in the way of vehicles to cover the debt. Let's go. Kathleen Horton paid Cumbria Roofing North West Limited £3,000 to apply a special liquid plastic waterproof coating to the stairs and balcony of her Cumbria property. But she wasn't happy with the quality of the work. The company eventually agreed to refund £1,800, but Kathleen never received the money. She took the company to court, where they contested the case. Mrs Horton won, but the company didn't pay up. Now she's paid £60 to take her claim to the High Court, and Chris and Steve are on their way to enforce the writ and get her money. The company is located a few miles south of Whitehaven in Cumbria. It's a bit grey, but Chris wouldn't be anywhere else. One of the most beautiful places in the UK, as far as I'm concerned. The weather's not the best. The summer is very similar to the winter. Chris and Steve soon find Cumbria Roofing North West Limited on an industrial estate. Looks like there's somebody in. There's another entrance. I'll have a look. Anything? Hello? There's something on in there. There's a phone number. Yeah. Give him a ring and see if we can get somebody here, basically, uh, to deal with uh, the situation. Could you give me a ring back urgently, please? The sheriffs have the right to enter commercial premises and seize property. If need be, they'll call a locksmith and force entry. But Steve is hoping to get someone to open up. There's no vans. Hello, sir. Is it possible for you to get back to the unit for us, please? It's Mr Pearson. We have a high court writ. You're not going to pay it? All right, is anybody who can come and deal with it for you? No, we don't. We, we can't come back tomorrow, sir. We need to deal with it. Now we're here to seize goods from the property. Now we do at this stage have power locksmith if needs be. I'd much rather deal with one of your employees or yourself. The concern you've got, sir, if you can't pay that, we have high court rip to seize your goods. I can wait for you, not a problem. All right, about an hour and a half, mate, yeah? Thanks for that, tell that. Hopefully that'll get him here. But all we can do now is have a coffee and wait for him to turn up. Just two minutes later, someone does turn up, but it's not the boss. Hi, are you from this young here, love? Yeah. Have you just come to work, have you? Yeah. Right, OK, right. We'll let you go and we'll see what you need to do, uh, and we can help out and wait for. I think it was a gentleman called Kevin on the phone. Right. We can wait for him, so... Right, no OK, thank you very much. As soon as she goes in, we can follow her in. But there's something Chris and Steve have failed to spot. Do you have a contact number for Mrs. Musson, love? I have No. They were the keys for the unit. No way. She's been told to come and get them. How many female roofers do you know? Yeah. How did we not see them? The seasoned enforcement officers failed to spot that the keys to the unit were on the windowsill, and the woman was able to take them from under their noses. Kevin, hey, it's Mr. Pearson. I've just spoken to you. Uh, the lady who I, I believe you've probably just spoken to to attend and remove the keys has done that. Uh, now, that's saying to me that you don't want to deal with this. Now, how long are you going to be, Kevin? You said an hour and a half, but why have you asked the lady to come and take the keys away? 30 minutes. Right, no problem. I'll see you when you get back then, thank you. Tell her 30 minutes. Give him 30 minutes, see if he turns up. Can't believe we didn't spot them keys. That shows me that he's not interested in paying today. The man calls back. He asks our camera to leave his property. He says he will meet Chris, but not in front of the cameras, and will call again with details of the meeting place. Hello, can I help? The man has arrived, but not wanting to be filmed, has concealed himself away from the company's unit. Bridge? Oh, yeah. yeah. No problem, mate. OK. Alone, Chris makes his way to the clandestine meeting place. Steve waits for a few minutes. Now he's going to help apply some pressure and hopefully get this case resolved. He's had enough time now. I think Chris should have been able to establish whether he's going to pay or not, so I will walk down and join him. Leave the van here. But as Steve makes to join the other two under the bridge, he's stopped in his tracks. 
Hello? Yeah, bring it round, yeah? He wants the card machines. Please, he's going to pay in full. Payment in full. It's a result for the sheriffs. Steve takes the machine to the man's van on the other side of the bridge, but is quickly back. Fellas not happy. But then again, it would be. He's just about to pay three grand out. He should have paid out months ago. And finally, the writ is settled in full. But Steve can't help reflecting on the keys he reckons Chris failed to spot. I would have thought he just would have found them straight away, so I didn't go and look for them. The key issue was very funny. He needs to be back in the classroom for a couple of days just to make sure he's up to scratch. Paid his debt off. Uh, there was no great concern about that, no grievance about doing that. Little concern about the cost, of course, such is life. A good result for Kathleen Horton, who will finally get the money she's due for the poor work done by Cumbria Roofing North West Limited. For Chris and Steve, it's been a straightforward job. Apart from the secret meetings under the bridge, and of course those keys. Yeah, I'm just going to blame that on Steve fully and fully. That's the end of the matter. Okay, I don't want to hear fun. anything else about it. <laughs> High court enforcement officers, commonly known as sheriffs, have to enforce writs all over the country. Today was an especially early start for Lawrence Grips and Kev McNally, who have already put some miles under their belt before breakfast. Uh, we're just coming into Bristol at the moment. It's half past eight in the morning. We're going to a business called Clayton Cars, or a, a BMW specialist garage. The person they're on their way to help is Mohammed Razak from Bristol. He owns and runs an off-license in the city. Cheers, then. Thank you. Recently, he decided to invest in a new car for pleasure and for work, buying a BMW 3 Series. My car was really important to me because I've got two businesses. You, you need to get around if you've got two businesses. Obviously, I need to carry stock, carry my staff members. It's part of life, having your own car. Mohammed bought the car for £16,000 and looked forward to driving it. But only a few days after purchasing it, the car encountered some minor problems. Needing to get it fixed, Mohammed looked online and soon thought he'd found the perfect place. It was called Clayton Cars, BMW Specialists. So I thought, why not take it to them? They looked really professional. Clayton Cars looked at the car and told him there were major problems with the engine. They said they could fix it, and Mohammed said he'd cover any costs and left it with them. After about three weeks, I called up the garage and I said, I haven't heard anything, what's the latest? They said there seems to be a problem that they cannot seem to work out what's wrong with the vehicle. I then was kind of losing faith in the garage, but I thought, they know what they're doing, they're BMW specialists, and quite a few people actually recommended me to them. And then after about six or seven weeks, I got very impatient, because at this time, I'm without my vehicle, I got to catch lifts, I got to ask my missus for a lift, I got to ask my parents for a lift, so I did really need my car. Mohammed says that over six weeks after they got the car, Clayton Cars told him they diagnosed problems with the catalytic converter and exhaust manifold. They said it would cost £3,169 to fix. Mohammed was happy to bear the cost for his beloved BMW. A few weeks later, with the work done, Mohammed paid up the £3,169 and drove his car home. Really happy. It drove absolutely perfect for the first few hours. After three hours of not making no issues, it then had the engine management light flashing. The car was shaking again, the gearbox was shaking, the exhaust manifold was making a noise, um, and the car revs wasn't still, and it was revving up and down. Instantly, I knew that something's not right. Mohammed decided to take his car to another BMW specialist. They now diagnosed a fault with the NOx sensor, which detects potentially damaging gases in the exhaust of the car. Mohammed says they told him it should have been replaced before any of the other repairs, because a faulty NOx sensor could harm key engine parts. It would cost another £3,500. Mohammed agreed. He says he asked Clayton Cars for a refund 
so he could pay this second bill, but they wouldn't pay. But until he paid their bill, the second garage held onto his car. So the vehicle should have been repaired in one week. It's cost me 8,000 to 9,000 pounds and left me without a vehicle for six to seven months. He was left with no option but to take Clayton Cars to court. It made me feel like they're taking me for a joke because I'm just a young boy and they think that they could just fob me off. I thought, right, I'm going to go to court and get my money off them. Clayton Cars didn't contest it. In their absence, the judgment went against them. Despite this, they still haven't paid the money awarded by the court. I've won my judgment. I still haven't received the money. If the sheriffs can't get the money, then no one will. It's now time for Lawrence and Kev to finally put an end to Mohammed's misery. What's the name of them? Clayton Cars. That's it. First challenge, find the boss. Mr Griggs, an enforcement officer, we've yeah. got a high court writ to execute against Clayton Cars okay. on behalf of Mr Mohammed Razak. OK, yeah. Um, we're ordered here by the court today to seize goods... Are you in a position to pay in full, or do you need to contact the governor, or...? I can contact him, yeah. Yeah, if you can do, yeah. yeah. Kev has a look around the workshop. As expected, there are plenty of assets that can be seized. The diagnostics as well. Do you want to show that to us? Um, got that thing over there. That's yours, yeah? That's OK. Kev's keen to list the diagnostic equipment. This kit is valuable, portable and vital. If it's seized, it could stop the garage working. Lawrence and Kev want to pressure the garage into finding the boss and paying up as quickly as possible. Taking an inventory and preparing to seize the gear usually has the desired effect. We've got this four post lift over there. There's another four two post lifts as well. So there's assets here if we need to remove. Lawrence doesn't like hanging about, but if he's forced to, it might as well be in a well-equipped workshop. He'd love a workshop like this. Full post lift, that's his dream. That's his lottery win, that is. Yes, indeed. But it's time to stop dreaming. The boss, Mr Soudan, has arrived. Morning. Good Morning. Good. Well, I'll just show you my ID. That's the actual notice of seizure. The amount outstanding is 5,483.46. Because it's been transferred up to the High Court for enforcement Sheriff's purposes, speed, you've got... Yeah. What's, who's the sheriff? Are you the sheriff? Well, our company, yeah. So that, that's the amount that's outstanding, just under five and a half grand. I got the 483. The owner has already spoken to his solicitors, who have assured him they're dealing with the case. It's a little bit premature, because they've sort of done what they can do, and they're waiting to hear back from the courts. I mean, problem being, we're here with a live writ, which orders us to seize goods to clear the debt. This is what the solicitor's just sent you. Uh, he sent this across. Well, can you just scroll it down, so I can, uh... The paperwork is an application to set aside the case, but no decision's been made. Yeah. Unfortunately, an application doesn't prevent enforcement in these paying now, or, or we're going to carry on enforcing the writ. We've taken an inventory of goods. Why well, can't you just wait for we this We can't, to... because, we're, because we have a live writ which orders yeah, us... It's, it's, a, it's, it's, not, a case, it's not a case of waiting. There was an order made for you to pay, you didn't. We've been ordered here today to seize goods to clear the debt, and you've got plenty of goods here to clear the debt. What, what bits do you want to take out in this place you're going to take some bits out? The main thing that leaps out to me is the, um, is the diagnostic kit over there. I'm quite happy to wait for your solicitor to phone you back, providing they're not ours, because we've been here Aaron, 40 minutes already. Lawrence is frustrated that the owner won't deal with the writ until his solicitor calls back. While they wait, Mr Soudan wants to explain his side of the story. Mohammed's car came in to us probably about sort of September, October last year, a non-start. Uh, I was there for, for probably a month or six weeks. In the end, we got to the bottom of why it wouldn't start. He had to have a, a couple of parts on the exhaust system and a catnet converter. Um, we got, they got the car running, so it was all good, but there was still one other thing to get done, which we advised him to do. And he continued to drive the car, so if he'd have had it done at the same time, this would be not talking about this. Mohammed disputes this version of events. 
Meanwhile, Lawrence is hoping to enforce his writ if Mr. Souden ever speaks to his solicitor. If you could get on it as quick as you can, I do appreciate it. I think he considers us taking his stuff as an option, whereas realistically, for him, that would be a very expensive option. Really, you pay it now, and the money's held for 14 days, or your goods are taken, and if you want to get them before they're sold at auction, you're then looking at probably another two grand on top just to buy your stuff back in time to stop it being sold. Again, the owner tries to get hold of his solicitor, and again he's told that they will call him back. Mohammed waited weeks for Clayton Cars to fix his BMW. The sheriffs have waited hours for the garage to respond to their writ. Frustration is growing. When we return, we'll see if Clayton Cars pays up. Enforcement officers Daryl Oriton and Mark Povey are in East Anglia, about to bring some unwelcome news to a firm in the demolition business. Just coming into um, a Suffolk now, a company called KT Demolition Limited. They've been sued in high courts by another company, and we're there for just under £9,000. The company took KT Demolition to court for work it carried out for them, but for which it wasn't fully paid. KT Demolition contested the claim, but the court awarded in the other company's favour. But they've still not received the money they're owed. So now, it's up to Daryl and Mark to get it for them. Arriving at KT Demolition's trading premises, it's clear they're not dealing with a multinational. Afternoon. Um, I guess you're Keith Topman. Yeah, um, I'm an enforcement officer from the High Courts. Yeah. We've, we've got a High Court writ, it's not against you, it's against your company, KT Demolition Limited. Right. We've come out today to collect the, the amount which is just under okay. £9,000 or two. And who, who are you? We're a High Court enforcement officer. Are you aware of this? Of, no, I'm not. You're not aware of the debt at all? I am, because I went to court over this. Right. Right, and, and the court... The court then turned round and sort of like Mollus threw it out of court. And Wrong. that is it. But that's not what the court documents say. See, we've got the original judgment case right. um, where the debt was... You've been ordered that the judgment for the claimant is 6, 8, 6, 9 and 10p and also to pay £250 costs payable within 14 days. Right because you haven't done that. I don't know anything about it. Right. I mean, did you attend the court here? Yeah. On the tw did. 28th of May? Yeah, I went. Norwich. Yeah. Right. I offered to pay the man so much. Yeah. I didn't re I didn't refuse the debt and nothing. Right? right. So, I said, yeah, I'd pay. But okay. he wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't accept installments. He wouldn't, no. Right, he you only one guy. No, he did. Yeah. And I didn't have it. Right. So what do you do when you haven't got it? Whatever Mr. Topman's excuse is, Daryl needs the debt paying today. So what are you got to do now? We what would generally we seize and re possibly remove assets. Can we take what you can? Is this where you, you are trading yeah. from, is it, yeah? What about the vehicle? Is that, in, is that your name or company name? Company. That's in the company name. Do you want to try? Do you want to I try? I mean, and that's, make that's, a, that's more than nine grand, that is. That is, yeah. 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 Would you be not better off trying to get the money raised as opposed for us taking removing that today? Daryl's being as helpful as he can. If he has to, he'll take the Range Rover to pay off the debt but it would be easier for him not to mention cheaper for Mr Topman if he could raise the cash another way. We'd rather give you a bit of time now to... I know you say you don't know anybody with that money, but get on the phone, max on phone calls, see what you can raise, rather than us phoning a truck to come and collect your vehicle straight away. At this stage, Daryl and Mark are invited in to speak to Mr Topman in private. We're asked to stay outside. <laughs> Soon after, Mr. Topman's wife arrives to help him out. Mr. Topman is adamant he went to court and the judge threw out the case against him, but Daryl's High Court writ tells a very different story. 
I think you're getting confused, Keith. The original judgment was, was awarded to him. And you're supposed to pay him 14 days. I think what's happened is you've disputed this. And in July, you've tried, you've tried to set the application for a set aside, which means to go back to court. But that was dismissed. You've been to court there, you lost your case, tried to take it back. That was thrown out. I've, I can only go on what I've got there. Faced with a high court writ, two enforcement officers in his house, and a very vulnerable looking Range Rover on his drive, it doesn't take Mr. Topman long to realise this debt isn't going away. After discussions with his wife, they agree to pay on her credit card. Sure, do you want it on credit or debit? Give me the option. <laughs> The money goes through without a problem. And I'll just give you a receipt. Keith Totman, meanwhile, wants to put his side of the story. I feel sick, absolutely sick, when I offered to pay the man. He wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted the full lot and won it. Like I said, I can't do it. So next thing, I'm in court. I told them in the, on, the, on the paperwork when I ripped at the courts and told them what the score was. Went to Norwich, they slung it out. Next thing, you boys are on my doorstep wanting the money, which I've just paid. I put my Jack Russells on you. <laughs> Where are you, Jack? <laughs> We don't like dogs. There was a couple of uh, Jack Russells, little dogs that were fine. It's a good score for Daryl and Mark, and means the company that brought the case will finally get the money that's rightfully theirs. In Bristol, Lawrence and Kev are trying to get BMW owner Mohamed Razak over £3,000 from Clayton Cars, who he says didn't repair his car properly. It made me feel like they're taking me for a joke because I'm just a young boy and they think that they could just fob me off. The garage owner won't deal with the writ until he's spoken to his solicitor, but he's been waiting a while. It's coming up to half eleven. If we go past twelve o'clock, I will be charging two hours waiting time. With no response from his solicitor, Mr. Soudin consults his bookkeeper. And the sheriff turned up today to get some money off of us. The bookkeeper suggests he contact the solicitor. Yeah, I try to get all the solicitors, and they're taking time to come back to me. Um, he's got he's got a uh, high court writ in front of him, so I can just I can just do that. You reckon? Yeah, apparently we, we, we shouldn't be, uh, it's all under the, in the hands of solicitors. And they're going to, we'll sort it out. <laughs> well, they may well do, but they haven't sorted it out today, have they? If you don't pay us, then we've got an awful lot of stuff to take out of here to clear the debt. Nothing personal, but you've got the assets there to, to enable us to clear this debt, I believe. Once again, Mr. Soudan tries to speak to his solicitors and convey how urgent the situation is. So you're seizing goods today? Yep. Yeah, they're seizing goods today. The solicitors say someone will call back. Thank, thank you very much. As quick as you can, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Bye. They're all getting hungry. They're not going to lunch, are they? No, they probably are. <laughs> ah. Finally, some three hours after the sheriff's arrived at the garage, the owner gets through to his solicitor. Do you mind having a chat with them? Yeah, sure, not a problem. Yeah, I'll pass you over. I'm a battery life left, I think. My Hello there. Yeah. Mr. Sound's aware that there's been a, an application to set aside. We have a live writ. It's a simple question, yes or no, and I know the answer. Does an application prevent enforcement of a writ? No, right, can, you can I just hand you to Mr. Soudan so you can tell him that then? Hello. Have you not done something you should have done for me? Mr. Soudan doesn't seem to like what he's hearing from the solicitor. I'm going to have to be on your case, aren't I? Because I've just left it to the, the experts of the solicitors and I've, and I've suddenly got um, the guy knocking on the door. 
The owner calls his bookkeeper and seems to be talking about payment. We can do the, um, you know, if we do it, if we do it that way. That's the account name, account number and the sort code. I don't think that's the right way. I don't think it's easy as ringing the police up. They probably... The police won't do anything. No, the police won't do anything. It's a hell of a lot of money and I don't want to hand it over. Come on, you've got to do it, Hey. You're still having a conversation about how you can get out of paying it. It's the full amount now. I've had enough. Lawrence calls up a truck so they can start removing goods. Yeah, if you can, do urgently, please. It's full amount. You can deal with Mohammed in court. End of. The guy's been going around in circles, really, literally asking anyone in the world for advice or how not to pay, basically. He's asked his solicitor, he's asked someone else's solicitor, and then he's, anyone else that wants to put their ten pence worth in has been doing so and it hasn't really got him anywhere. Advice is coming from everywhere. Nobody is telling you how it is other than me. There's no arguments to be had anymore. This is the bottom line, this is the way it is. A few minutes later, Lawrence's message seems to have got through. The bookkeeper arrives at the garage. So this, so this is the sheriff. She tells Lawrence that the case is in dispute no, and going to court. No disrespect to yourself, I know you've just sort of come into this, but. I'm not going into another lengthy discussion about the whys and wherefores of us being here. We're entitled to be here. That is how much needs paying, or we will be removing stuff. I've already queued the office up to line up a truck to come down and take it with some men to lift the stuff out. She tells Lawrence he can't take the tools of the trade. Yeah. They're not tools of the trade. The only things that are tools of the trade are the guy's personal hand tools. Are you acting on the gentleman's authority to come down and pay this? because we've been going on for four hours, 45 minutes. We're not going to stay around while you have the discussion of whether he's spoken to his solicitors. That's something for you to deal with afterwards. If you're acting on his authority to pay it, pay it. And finally, that's exactly what the bookkeeper does. There's your receipt. OK, then, Mr Sam, we'll leave you in peace. And obviously, whatever the courts say, we'll comply with. OK, bye-bye. That was not the job from hell, but it was a war of attrition. Nearly five hours there, but we got payment in full in the end. We've got two weeks to hopefully go to court and try and reclaim our money back, which I thought, think we fully will win the case. Since we filmed, Clayton Cars pushed on with their application to have the judgment set aside. And this time, both the garage and their solicitor were present in court. Mohamed Razak had to face them alone. The judge rejected the garage's request for the judgment to be set aside, which means Mohammed keeps the money the sheriff's recovered from Clayton Cars. And he has a message for any individuals wondering if they could take on a business and win. Do go to the courts, because there is justice out there, and look up how to fight a case in court. Another success for a member of the public who fought for his rights.